Hello students, we are now going to talk about economic reforms since 1991 under the subject Indian economy. We will proceed this way. First, we will take up the background of this particular topic followed by objectives, then the reasons for economic reforms and the various features. Since independence, India followed the mixed economy framework by combining the advantages of the market economic system with those of the planned economic system. Some scholars argue that over the years, this policy resulted in the establishment of a variety of rules and laws which were aimed at controlling and regulating the economy and instead ended up hampering the process of growth and development. Others state that India, which started its developmental path from near stagnation, has since been able to achieve growth in savings, developed or diversified industrial sector, which produces a variety of goods and has experienced sustained expansion of agricultural output, which has ensured food security. In 1991, India met with an economic crisis relating to its external debt. The government was not able to make repayments on its borrowings from abroad. Foreign exchange reserves, which we generally maintain to import petroleum, oil and other important items, dropped to levels that were not sufficient even for fortnight. The crisis was further compounded by rising prices of essential goods. All these led the government to introduce a new set of policy measures which changed the direction of our developmental strategies. Now what is economic reform? Economic reforms refers to a set of economic policies with the goal of making the economy more market and service oriented and expanding the role of private sector and foreign investment. Let us now come to the objectives of economic reforms. The first objective is to make the economy more competitive. The second one is to accelerate the economic growth. Third, to make the industries more efficient and highly productive. Fourth, to make use of global resources for the development of Indian economy. Number five, to rationalize the role of public enterprises and improve their performance. Number six, to control fiscal deficit. Number seven, to reduce current account deficit of balance of payment. Let us now come to the reasons for economic reforms. That means why we opted for economic reforms. The economic condition of India in the year 1991 was miserable. It was due to the cumulative effect of number of reasons. Let us discuss the various reasons for making the reasons for economic reforms. The first one is poor performance of the public sector. The second one here is deficit in balance of payments. Then the third one is inflationary pressures in the economy, fall in foreign exchange reserves, huge burden of debt on the economy, Gulf crisis, inefficient management of the economy. Let us now tell these particular reasons one by one. First, come to poor performance of public sector. In the 40 years since 1951 to 1990, public sector was assigned an important role to work for the economic development of India. During initial 15 years, public sector undertakings performed satisfactorily, but thereafter, most of them started incurring losses. However, except for few enterprises, the overall performance was very disappointing. Considering the huge losses incurred by a good number of public sector enterprises, the government emphasized the need for necessary reforms and greater emphasis on the private sector. Come to deficit in balance of payments. 
deficit in balance of payment arises when total foreign payments for imports exceed total foreign receipts from exports. Even after imposing heavy tariffs and quotas, there was a sharp rise in imports. On the other hand, there was slow growth of exports due to low quality and high prices of Indian goods in the international market. India's BOP deficit has been constantly rising since 1980-81. It was estimated at rupees 2,210 crores in 1980-81 and rose to approximately more than 17,000 crores in 1990-91. Now let us take up the issue of inflationary pressures. There was a consistent rise in the general price level in the economy due to increase in money supply and shortage of essential goods. The rate of inflation reached an all-time high of around 17 percent. It further increased the gap between imports and exports as India's export became uncompetitive in the world market and its export earnings dropped drastically. Come to fall in foreign exchange reserves. In 1991, foreign exchange reserves fell to the lowest level and it led to the foreign exchange crisis in the country. Foreign exchange reserves declined to a level that was not adequate to finance imports for more than two weeks and neither to pay the interest to the international lenders. Come to the point, huge burden of debt. The expenditure of the government was much higher than the revenue. As a result, government had to borrow money from banks, public and from international financial institutions. In 1991, fiscal deficit was 8.4 percent of gross domestic product. International Monetary Fund, that is IMF, decided to advance loan of $7 billion, but at the same time insisted that Indian government should introduce economic reforms of the economy. Come to the point, Gulf crisis. On account of Iraq war, in 1990-91, prices of crude oil shot up. India used to receive huge amount of remittance from Gulf countries. In the wake of the war, this took a serious hit and the Gulf crisis further widened the balance of payment deficit. Let us discuss inefficient management of the economy. The origin of the financial crisis can be traced from the inefficient management of the Indian economy. The government was not able to generate sufficient revenue from internal sources such as taxation, running of the public sector enterprises, etc. And simultaneously, the government expenditure began to exceed its revenue by such large margins that it became unsustainable. At times, the foreign exchange borrowed from other countries and international financial institutions was spent on meeting consumption needs. This is the background of the new economic policy. The crisis became so acute that the government had to mortgage gold to raise further loans. For availing the loan, these international agencies expected India to liberalize and open up the economy. The suggestions given by them, number one, remove restriction on private sector, number two, reduce the role of the government in the market and number three, remove trade restrictions. India agreed to all these conditions which were put forth by the World Bank and the IMF and they announced the new economic policy accordingly in July 1991. It consisted of wide range of economic reforms. The main aim of the policy was to create a more competitive environment in the economy and remove the barriers to entry and growth of firms. The two important measures of the policy are stabilization measures and structural reform measures. What is stabilization measure? They refer to short term measures 
which aim at correcting of the balance of payments deficit by maintaining sufficient foreign exchange reserves and controlling inflation by keeping the rising prices under control. Coming to the structural reform measures, they refer to long term measures which aim at improving the efficiency of the economy, increasing international competitiveness by removing the rigidities in various segments of the Indian economy and increasing the competitiveness of Indian products internationally. Let us discuss the main features of the new economic policy. The government initiated different policy changes which fall under three major heads. Number one, liberalization, number two, privatization and number three, globalization. What is liberalization? Before 1991, there were large number of government restrictions in India in terms of licensing requirement for setting up of industries, import and export trade, dealings in foreign exchange, etc. In July 1991, a package of economic reforms was announced which marked the beginning of process of liberalization in India. What is the meaning of liberalization then? Liberalization means removal of restrictions on the private sector. In other words, it implies liberating the trade and industry from unwanted government controls and restrictions. Liberalization contains two things. Number one, relaxation in the rules and regulations made for the private sector. Number two, to allow private sector to run those industries which were earlier reserved for the public sector. The process of liberalization was to unlock the economic potential of the country by encouraging private sector and multinational corporations to invest and expand to introduce much more competition into the economy and provide incentives for increasing efficiency of operations. They should further reduce the debt burden of the country and use the important route for capital goods and machinery from developed countries. Economic reforms taken by the government under liberalization include the following. Number one, industrial sector reforms. Number two, financial sector reforms. Number three, tax reforms. Number four, foreign exchange reforms, number five, trade and investment policy reforms. Let us discuss these points one by one. The first one is industrial sector reforms. In order to make necessary reforms in the industrial sector, the government introduced new industrial policy in 1991. The various measures under industrial policy reforms include reduction in industrial licensing, reducing the role of public sector, reforms under small scale industries, monopolies and restrictive trade practices that is MRTP Act which was replaced by Competition Act in 2002. What is reduction in industrial licensing? The new policy abolished industrial licensing for all the industries except for a short list of industries which include liquor, cigarettes, hazardous chemicals, defense equipments, industrial explosives, etc. No licenses were needed to set up new units, expand or diversify the existing line of manufacture. However, license was required for certain industries related to security and strategic considerations. Reducing the role of public sector units one of the salient features was reduction in the role of public sector in the industrial development of the country. The number of industries exclusively reserved for the public sector were reduced from 17 to 8. Reforms under small scale industries. Many goods produced by small scale industries have now been de-reserved. This was achieved by increasing the investments limit for small scale industries to rupees 5 crores. Market forces were allowed to determine the prices 
in many industries rather than being decided by the government. The Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act and which was replaced now by Competition Act. You know earlier production capacity was linked with licensing. With the introduction of liberalization and expansion of schemes, the requirement for large companies to seek prior approval for expansion, establishment of new undertakings, merger, amalgamation, etc., were eliminated. Now, producers could expand their business according to their own will depending on market conditions. In 2002, MRTP Act has been replaced by Competition Act 2002, which is more liberal. Let us come to financial sector reforms. Financial sector reform includes the following. The role of RBI was reduced from regulator to facilitator of financial sector. Then the reform policies led to the establishment of private sector banks, Indian as well as foreign. Number three, the limit of foreign investment in banks was raised to around 50 percent. The foreign institutional investors, FII, were allowed to invest in Indian financial markets. This is followed by banks were given freedom to set up new branches. You know financial sector includes financial institutions such as commercial banks, investment banks, stock exchange operations and foreign exchange market. The financial sector in India is controlled by the Reserve Bank of India that is RBI. The role of RBI was reduced from regulator to facilitator of financial sector. For instance, till 1991, RBI was deciding the interest rates for banks on loans and deposits. Thus, financial sector was allowed to take decisions on many matters without consulting the RBI. The reform policies led to the establishment of private sector banks, which includes Indian banks as well as foreign banks. For example, Indian banks like ICICI and foreign banks such as HSBC increased the competition and benefited the consumers through lower interest rates and better services. The limit of foreign investment in banks was raised to around 50 percent. Foreign institutional investors such as merchant bankers, mutual funds and pension funds are allowed to invest in Indian financial market. Though banks have been given permission to generate resources from India and abroad, certain powers have been retained with the RBI to safeguard the interests of the account holders and the nation. Banks were given freedom to set up new branches, of course, after fulfillment of certain conditions without the prior approval of the RBI. Now, banking services are available in almost every corner of the country. Come to the next point that is tax reforms. Tax reforms refers to reforms in government's taxation and public expenditure policies, which are collectively known as fiscal policy. Taxes are of two types, the direct tax and the indirect tax. Direct taxes are those taxes which where the burden and the imposition is on the same person. It consists of taxes on income of individuals as well as profits of business enterprises. For example, income tax which is taxes on individual incomes and corporate tax which is taxes on profits of companies. Burden of these taxes cannot be shifted. The second one is indirect taxes. It referred to those taxes where the burden and imposition are on two different people. These affect the income of persons through their consumption expenditure. Indirect taxes are generally imposed on goods and services. For example, sales tax, VAT, that is VAT, value added tax, custom duty, etcetera. 
burden of these taxes can be shifted. Now, the new system of taxes being introduced in India is the goods and services tax, which is popularly known as GST. The major tax reforms made are as follows reduction in taxes, reforms in indirect taxes, and simplification of process. Let us come to reduction in taxes. Since 1991, there has been a continuous reduction in income and corporate tax as high tax rates were an important reason for tax evasion. It is now widely accepted that moderate rates of income tax encourage savings and voluntarily disclose of income. Reforms in indirect taxes, it consists of considerable reform which have been made in indirect tax to facilitate establishment of common national market for goods and commodities. Efforts are being made to ensure uniform application of GST that is goods and services tax in all states of the country. The GST was finally implemented on 1st July 2017. What do you mean by simplification of procedure? You know, in order to encourage better compliance on the part of taxpayers, many procedures have been simplified. Before 1991, taxpayers were reluctant to file tax return because there were lots of formalities and difficulties for an individual to file on its own. Coming to foreign exchange reforms, this includes the following. The first one is devaluation of the rupee and second one is allowing the market forces. The important reforms made in foreign exchange market are the devaluation of rupee. This means reduction in the value of domestic currency in terms of foreign currency by the government. To overcome balance of payment crisis, the rupee was devalued against foreign currencies. This led to an increase in the inflow of foreign exchange. What do you mean by allowing the market forces? The government allowed rupee value to be free on its control. As a result, market forces of demand and supply determine the exchange value of the Indian rupee in terms of foreign currency. Finally, come to trade and investment policy reforms. This includes removal of quantitative restrictions on imports and exports, removal of export duties, reduction in import duties, relaxation in import licensing system. You know, before 1991, a lot of restrictions were imposed on imports to protect the domestic industries. However, this protection reduced the efficiency and competitiveness of domestic industries which led to the slow growth. So, the reforms in the trade and investment were initiated to increase the international competitiveness in industrial production, to promote foreign investments and technology into the economy, to promote efficiency of domestic industries and adoption of latest technologies and to give freedom to foreign investors to have a majority of share in the equity. The important trade and investment policy reforms include removal of quantitative restrictions on imports and exports. You know under the new economic policy NEP, quantitative restrictions on imports and exports were greatly reduced. For example, quantitative restrictions on imports of manufactured consumer goods and agricultural products were fully removed from April 2001. Removal of export duties. This means export duties were removed to increase the competition of Indian goods in the international market. Number three in this particular section is reduction in import duties, which means import duties were reduced to improve the position of domestic goods in the foreign market. Policy of protection to the domestic industries has now been given up. There has been a clear shift in emphasis on export promotion and import substitution. Next comes 
relaxation in import licensing system. The import licensing was abolished except in case of hazardous and environmentally sensitive industries. This encouraged domestic industries to import raw materials at better prices, which raised their efficiency and made them more competitive. This is all about the first part of the economic reforms since 1991. Now, let us summarize what we learnt. Before 1991, Indian economy was facing problems of declining foreign exchange reserves, increasing the gap between imports, exports and high inflationary pressure. It forced the policy makers to change its economic policy in 1991, particularly due to the financial crisis and pressure from international organizations such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Major reforms were undertaken in the industrial and financial sectors of Indian economy. One of the major reforms included foreign exchange deregulations and liberalization. It opened the doors for different kinds of new avenues, which proved a benchmark in the Indian economy. Thank you.